All right. Um, so um, good morning, everybody. I don't, I don't know how you feel, um, but I have to say I am a little tired um, after the last um, night. Um, it was an um, exceptional, exciting um, election um, night in Germany. Um, and usually I would say um, all other countries' elections are more exciting than ours, but I have to revise my opinion. Um, this year was a really um, exciting um, exciting uh, election night. So welcome everybody to our Aspen International Pre Press Luncheon. Germany has voted and what next, what now? Um, this is what we want to discuss today um, with a really um, esteemed um, panel. Before I introduce um, the panel to you, um, I just wanted to share um, a couple of impressions I had with regard to our elections and um, things which surprised me. Um, and the first thing which surprised me is um, that it was, or slightly surprised me, that it was a really pretty bad election result um, for the CDU. They lost 9% of votes compared to the 2017 um, elections. Um, now, maybe you all of, all of you expected that. It surprised me a little bit that they fared um, so badly um, in the end. It also surprised me that the SPD caught up so tremendously um, after it lagged behind so much um, earlier on in the election um, campaign, and that it really uh, made an incredible comeback. Um, what also surprised me a little bit is how much um, the election campaigns were about people um, and not so much about programs, certainly not very much about foreign policy um, issues. What did not surprise me so much was the regional results um, of the elections with a north-south divide and the east-west divide. But what really surprised me were um, the voting results um, according to age groups. Um, and I don't know if you had a chance to look at it already, but what really surprised me were that the young voters um, and the first time voters voted majorly green, that didn't surprise me, and FDP which very much surprised me. Um, and I was not so much surprised that uh, older age groups tended to vote more for SPD um, and uh, the CDU. And what surprised me a little bit also were the results of the Greens. Um, I thought that overall they would fare a little bit better, but they certainly still made the best um, election results um, in, in, in their history. So exciting surprises and not so much surprises. And um, as I said earlier, this, this is today um, our session where we want to look forward and want to specifically look at foreign policy issues. So let me introduce um, our panelists um, to you. Um, and let me start with uh, Cécile, Cécile Boutelet. She is economics and business um, correspondent at Le Mans. Um, thank you so much for being here today, Cécile. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Our second um, panelist is Tom Natal. He is a uh, Berlin Bureau Chief um, of The Economist. Uh, thank you so much, Tom, for joining us uh, today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. Um, Melissa, Melissa Eddy, is Berlin correspondent of The New York Times. Um, thank you so much, Melissa, for being here um, today. Happy to be here, Stormy. <laughs> And um, Fai Karavati, she is foreign correspondent, Athens News Agency and Alpha TV. Thank you so much for joining us um, as well. It's great to be here as well. Thank you. And Jasper von Alten Bochum, he is head of domestic politics, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Um, you are our German, German voice today um, on this panel. Jasper, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Hello. And I would like to start with, a, um, with the same question to all of our um, panelists. Um, and I would like to start with you, Cecile. And my question is, on a scale, zero to 10, with zero for no changes and 10 for a lot of changes, um, how much do you think is the bilateral relationship between Germany and your country going to change after the elections? Cecile. Well, I would say five because I am in, I'm uh, there, there are a lot of uncertainty uh, depends on the general partners in the coalition, but maybe we can talk about it later. Okay, I note that down. 
a good middle um, of, yeah. f- <laughs> of five. Um, Tom, how is the relationship going to change between the UK and Germany? I think I'm going to give it a one, possibly at most a two relative to where the relationship has been on, under Merkel. Um, the first thing to figure out is to what extent can a bilateral relationship be forged from the ruins of Brexit. And I think from the German perspective, uh, until the British government figures out how it wants to manage this Northern Irish issue, this long-term irritant in the Brexit discussion, these attempts to forge a bilateral relationship are going to have to wait. Great, thank you so much. So I now did note it down a one, and if you're very courageous, you would give it a two maximum. <laughs> thank you. So Melissa, um, US-German relations, how much are they going to change? I am giving it a four right now, I think because Schultz has been in Merkel's government or, and because you know the SPD has been in government, it's not going to be that tremendous. Also because uh, of the state of US and, and German relations. I think that uh, you know there's some key issues that that we're looking at. Uh, Nord Stream, NATO being one of them. You know, some of them are European. There's still the tariffs issue. There's certainly enough spaces for there to be um, progress made. But I don't know that Schultz is going to really be eager to to upset everything very quickly. Interesting. So I noted down a a four. And uh, Faye, um, how much are our bilateral relationship going to change? Um, You need to unmute yourself. (laughs) Try it again. Okay. So I would, so whatever the coalition, I would say no more than three. In case of a CDU-led government, to the worse. In case of an SPD-led government, probably to the better. Wow, so many of you are expecting more continuity than big, big changes. Now let me turn to um, Jasper um, and uh, have a look at the German side. How much do you think is foreign German foreign policy going to change after the elections? Well, I, w- I would say that in general there, there won't be too much change um, um, in the substance of our foreign policy. Um, but I would say so. So I would um, I'm more on the side of Tom. I would say one or two. Uh, on the scale, and uh, but when it comes to to the style and to the way we will act in our foreign policy, then I would say it's four or five. I mean, uh, I mean, nothing to say. Um, profound foreign policy expert. He, his whole career, he wanted to be a foreign politics expert, and that's his. Uh, um, that what he really likes to do. Um, on the other side, Olaf Scholz had so far uh, only one chance to some violent images in foreign policy that was on the EU, um, on the EU uh, level and uh, with his final policy. But he's not, not um, I don't know, he, he is not to So uh, if it comes to a traffic light uh, coalition with him as, as chancellor, I would say uh, the changes might be bigger than with Armin Laschet. Um, Armin Laschet is, uh, is a uh, convinced European po- politician. And he will do a lot for the transatlantic relationship, I guess. So, and that's in the continuity. Great, thank you so much. I think we have to work a little bit um, on the sound. Um, sometimes it sounds really good. Okay. Um, too far away, I think, from the computer or from the mic, it gets a little hard. All right, okay, I'll do my best. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so we, we just heard lots of, lots of continuity and not the big paradigm uh, shifts or changes. Um, so let me come back to, um, to Tom because you had one of the lowest ratings with regard to, um, with regard to change. Maybe you can explain to us a little 
um, more in depth where we currently stand um, in the UK German relationship, but also also in the context of the whole geoeconomic geopolitical power game uh, with taking into consideration what just happened last week um, with the US with AUKUS um, and and everything going on with the with the submarine deal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, AUKUS is interesting. I, I was sort of watching the the German reaction to this quite closely. Um, Frankly, there wasn't much of one, and certainly not publicly. Um, there were sort of some statements of moderate support for the French position, the French fury um, from, from some German officials, uh, generally sort of junior ones. Um, but actually my sense, and I think this sort of sums up a lot, a lot about German foreign policy, um, is that some of the biggest concerns that you have in, in, in the German system about what's happened with this deal are simply uh, a fear that the French will make life a lot more difficult inside the EU. So you had uh, French officials saying, well, you can forget about doing a trade deal, the EU doing a trade deal with Australia, for example. Um, there were some questions over whether the planned Trade and Technology Council discussion with the Americans would proceed, um, something which I think that some, some parts of the German establishment are quite invested in that. That's, that's going to go ahead. And a lot of this stuff is, um, uh, it's is sort of heat of the moment stuff that's going to, to, to fade away in time. Um, but in a way, that's the point, you know, to what extent is, um, are the Germans thinking more strategically, more long term about what this means for the shift in power dynamics in, in the Indo-Pacific region? Now we have, we've had for, I think, a couple of years now, a set of guidelines for German strategy in the, in the Indo-Pacific. We also have um, I, I think it was a day after the submarine deal was announced that the EU launched its Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, whatever you think of this new deal uh, that's been done with the Americans, Brits and, and the Australians, um, it's clear, it clearly represents a paradigm shift in the way that security is going to be organized going forward in this part of the world in which Germany now claims to have an important strategic relationship. So it ought to be thinking about how it is going to position itself and how Europe is going to be positioning itself. I'm not really getting a strong sense of very much thought is going into that. Now, of course, it happened at the end of an election campaign where it's very difficult to make sort of long-term foreign policy strategic um, uh, thinking. Uh, but to me, the instinct here is still, for the most part, to think about the sort of the short term and the tactical of what is this going to mean for how well, uh, how, how coherent the EU is as a negotiating bloc, um, rather than about the, the sort of big tricky strategic questions. And then just a, a quick thought on, um, on the kind of bilateral relationship post-Brexit. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll read you out something that Olaf Scholz has just said this morning. He was asked in a press conference, I mean, Britain is having all of these troubles now with a lack of drivers for, for trucks to, to bring in goods. And, um, and, and the British government has announced that it will issue some visas to, to European truck drivers to come in and help alleviate the shortages. Olaf Scholz was asked about this and he said, we can't send German truckers to Britain to help solve the crisis. We tried to convince Britain to stay in the EU where workers can move freely and maybe they should think about making their wages more attractive. So I think that's a pretty sort of clear signal that you're not going to get, for at least from an Olaf Scholz government, um, a, a radical change of perspective towards post-Brexit Britain in this bilateral relationship than we've had in the previous government. I think, frankly, that was pretty clear before the election. I think it's going to be clear after the election as well. This relationship has to be rebuilt from the ground up, and that's going to take a long time. Mm, great. Thank you so much um, also for, for the look at the uh, bilateral relationship. Just um, one follow up question with regard to geopolitics and the Indo-Pacific. Indo um, do you think that the uh, strategic relevance with regard to trade, um, but also with regard to um, foreign policy and security, um, is this something which um, members of the different parties are aware of in Germany or is that something we still have to learn? I mean, my sense is that it depends on who you're talking to. Like, it's quite interesting in Germany. You do find there are people in almost all parties um, who are thinking clearly and in a sort of an interesting way about how to get Germany, the German establishment more broadly 
um, to think about national interest, to think about grand strategy, to think about emerging geopolitical political competition and all of this sort of thing. And what's quite funny for me is that often when you talk to these people, you almost have a feeling that they often have more in common with each other than they might do with the establishment of their respective parties. And they are there, and then they are sort of slowly forcing the, co the, the conversation. I think AKK has done an interesting job as defense minister. But if you look at people in positions of power and decision-making authority, AKK feels like quite a sort of a lonely voice out there. You know, she's pushing an interesting and a difficult conversation. You don't always feel like she has the backing um, of that many members of, of her own party or, or, or of the German decision-making establishment more broadly. So things are moving, but they're happening very slowly. They're happening at a subterranean level. They're happening, frankly, in a very German fashion. And it's going to take quite a long time until we see a serious shift. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. Let's jump on to the other side of the um, Atlantic, um, since we already talk about geopolitics um, and the Indo-Pacific. And um, so, Melissa, transatlantic relations. Um, we were very hopeful after the Biden election that there would be a restart of the relationship. Um, now, the last couple of weeks were a little troubled. Um, so what's going to happen now after our elections? Well, I think exactly that point you make, Stormy, is what makes it so complicated. Everyone looked to Joe Biden here in Germany to really revive, return to multilateralism, which he has done. But then the damage of the extremely chaotic exit from Afghanistan, where the Germans, I think, felt that the rug was just pulled out from under them because the Americans were racing to meet a deadline that they appeared in the end clearly unprepared to have met. And now it puts Germany in this very difficult position of, on the one hand, um, they're, you know, extremely dependent on, on the U.S. militarily. On the other hand, they're realizing that that, that has left them coming up quite short um, because being dependent on the Americans is no longer what it used to be. At the same time, something that I find very interesting that is not being talked about here in Germany a whole lot is how dependent the Americans are actually on the Germans because right now there are still 9,000 Afghans sitting on Ramstein Air Base. Um, their evacuation was delayed because of a measles outbreak. Um, but nonetheless, uh, no one has raised that really, I think because they didn't want to bring it up in the election, but it shows that, that this relationship actually does go both ways, something that the Americans are not always, you know, really eager to talk about coming out, out of Washington. Um, but then as uh, with the submarine deal, as Tom was just saying, you know, we see that the Germans did not really have a very uh, strong position. And there was some discussion, you know, on the one hand, that emotionally our support is with France, but um, militarily we're strong with the US. And it seemed like this idea of really wanting to have their cake and eating it too. And, and that I think a new German government is going to have to figure out where they are positioning themselves vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States and China. That of course is not only a German decision, it will depend heavily on, on the European Union and where uh, France you know, decides to be, which is at the moment a very complicated position, which is not gonna make it any easier um, for whoever the next the next chancellor is to be able to sort things out. The one interesting thing about um, Olaf Scholz, of course, is that he went over to the United States. He went over to Washington. He had solid talks with Biden and he uh, and Janet Yellen sat down and he got the Americans on board for this multilateral project of, of the global corporate tax agreement, um, which is a real initiative that could give him you know, potentially some some weight um, on the global stage, but at the same time, with some of the tougher issues looking you know, that we're looking at, including the other one being Nord Stream. Um, if the Social Democrats wind up with the Greens in a strong position in their well, whoever actually winds up with the Greens in, in a strong position in their government, the Greens are very against uh, the Nord Stream Two project, and that could further complicate relationship the relationship with Washington. This is, this is really, really interesting, Melissa. Let me also ask you a follow-up question. Looking at the base of the parties um, and specifically the SPD and the, and the Greens, um, do you see a lot of love for the transatlantic relationship? Um, 
love would be love is a strong word. Yeah. Um, I would be reluctant to say a lot of love. What I do find really interesting, though, is in both of the parties you mentioned, the SPD and the Greens, there is a strong young progressive strain. And if you look at uh, the squad, for example, in the in the Democratic Party of the United States, there is also a strong, uh, very young strain. And I you know, unfortunately, I think that strain, because there's so many social issues and progressive issues that need dealing with in the United States, that focusing on foreign relations has not really been front and center of any of those young progressives. But in theory, um, it is it does raise an interesting question of is there a potential that a new generation could could actually sort of redefine what a transatlantic relationship could look like. Uh, that is purely hypothetical at this point. And right now, I think um, it, it will be more problematic uh, with those young progressives coming out of Germany vis-a-vis -vis where Washington is at uh, than some great new revival, as cool as I think that would be. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much um, also for reminding us um, that we do have to look also not at, not just at the establishment, um, but also of the young political leaders um, waiting to take leadership uh, positions. Um, and just real quickly, I'm going to cut in. That is one of the surprises that I found. I thought it was really interesting that the SPD actually they grew by a lot of young new members of parliament and who are coming in. And it's it, that really I'm wondering if that could have an impact because compared to the U.S. where we saw when the squad came in, when this group of young progressive uh, Democrats came in and and they've really been able to promote some of the issues. It does raise the question, what could that mean? For, uh, for the SPD if they get in government. Oh yeah, thank you so much for pointing that out. That is um, really an important uh, issue. Um, so let me turn to Cecile. Our, our um, German-French relationship has not always been so super easy um, over the last years. Um, and the relationship um, Merkel-Macron was solid, good, but also not without its confrontations. Um, so how are the elections perceived um, over um, in France and what, um, which kind of government would the, uh, the French government like to see um, here in Berlin um, with regard to topics, but also people to work with? Yeah, if, thank you for the question. It's an interesting question because, uh, uh, yes, uh, the, the Merkel-Macron uh, relationship hasn't been always very easy. It's a matter of, of, of rhythm, of, uh, of ambition. And uh, at the beginning, uh, so four years ago, you had the, the big speech of the Sorbonne, the Sorbonne University, where Macron detailed a uh, big ambition and big plan for Europe. And uh, on the other side of the Rhine, Rhine um, Merkel had no government, so she was blocked and Macron uh, waited like almost six months to have an answer. And at the end, it was a, a very disappointing answer for him. Nevertheless, I would say that the four, the last four years had been very, have been very good uh, time for French-German uh, relationship, not at the first front, but uh, in on the on the economics and 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 uh, industrial politics. Um, uh, so we have a, a very Germanophile uh, um, minister. He's called uh, Bruno Le Maire, and he can he speaks very well German. It, it knows Germany very well and he worked as well uh, with Olaf Scholz so as a result you have seen this what what Melissa mentioned before uh, this global tax uh, corporate tax agreement and the other side you had uh, the industrial politics was which was very long time very taboo in in Germany but not in France, uh, but not in France. But in this case, uh, you had a, a momentum uh, also with the pandemics um, where um, German industry and uh, German uh, economy uh, ministry uh, had seen uh, that the um, European industry had to reinforce itself like with the chips problem and the battery problem. So you had 
strong policies, European policies, not, not just German French, but also policy uh, for whole Europe to develop uh, those, uh, so to work together on this issue. And of course, uh, one of the big, big uh, uh, um, achievement of this, uh, uh, of this dialogue has been the, 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 um, uh, the recovery fund after the pandemics. Uh, and uh, that was a point, a moment where uh, Germany and France had uh, uh, had communicated very well together. And of course, now uh, we have a uh, um, um, moment of more concern because a new government comes and it's not about Olaf Scholz or I mean Nashet, but uh, as I said before, it's all about the junior partners, especially Christian Lindner and the uh, Free Democrats. Why? Because Christian Lindner has signalized he is uh, very much, uh, he wants to stick to the, this uh, fiscal policy orthodoxy. Uh, so don't touch the, so the debt uh, uh, issue uh, is, uh, he doesn't want to touch to the uh, stability pact. So the, the debt uh, criterion in Europe, in Eurozone. And uh, so we, I think Paris is expecting what comes what comes with this uh, issue uh, because it's uh, it's discussing there has strong there are strong difference with the greens so it could be at the end maybe maybe I don't know very creative and maybe more European uh, um, solution uh, in this uh, in these issues it, I think it's that's what uh, Paris is expecting. Um, that at least the debate about those policies, those fiscal policy um, comes more, so that more, more arguments are coming. And um, I would say to, I would say that I've been uh, by Olaf Scholz in his team, and I, I would underline uh, what Melissa said before, that you have new young people in this uh, ministry uh, who have been studying in US, have been uh, they cr their career in, in, in the US, and they, uh, they are bringing more, yeah, move in the classical orthodox effects, this kind of policy, but I think at least we could have a debate on in, in Germany and then in Europe, and it could be interesting in the in the in the next years because uh, that's what definitely uh, Paris and Rome are expecting. Great thank you so much Cecile um, for this overview. I think we come back to the um, issue of um, uh, the European Union and also financial issues um, and the prospect of a fiscal union when we talk about our minister our future Minister of Finance. I think it's going to be very interesting how the coalition is going to look like and who is going to head our finance uh, ministry. And since we are already uh, talking about financial issues and the European Union, um, that's a great lead over to you, Faye. Um, I remember um, during the time of the financial crisis and then the Euro crisis, um, Greek-German relations were not so great, I mean, because of our focus on fiscal austerity and the hardship which that also caused um, in, in Greece. Um, on the other hand, I saw some polling data by um, ECFR on the popularity of Merkel, and she seems to regain some popularity, interestingly, also um, in, in, in Greece, which um, uh, is surprising, and but maybe not so surprising. So. Handing it over to you, Faye, um, where are we going to go in our bilateral relationship? So, first of all, let me say that Greece played absolutely no part in this election, which to me, as a Greek journalist and as a Greek native, it was a huge relief, I must say. So, all in all, even though the current Greek prime minister and the outgoing chancellor um, never had a great chemistry between them, uh, the two countries the, uh, have actually normalized their relations for a few years now. So if nothing spectacular happens in the near future, I don't expect a great shift in the relations. But there's a, a paradox here. Um, 
We, uh, well, and one more paradox when it comes to Greece. Uh, we have a um, single party conservative government in Greece, a member of the European uh, Popular Party, um, but they have been secretly praying for anything other than a CDU led government in Germany. Um, and even if, uh, well, uh, even worse, if they are paired with a liberal finance minister. So um, it all has to do with the stability pact and its upcoming review. And in well, when a country has a sky high public debt, as Greece does, it's bound to think that they will probably do better with a socialist point of view on the other side. So moreover, the um, uh, German center left has always had um, friendlier positions when it comes to issues like uh, fiscal policy, of course, and then the refugee crisis and Turkey and weapons exports, uh, even maybe the World War II reparations, which we've been claiming for a few years now. Uh, so definitely uh, Greece would be in favor of a socialist uh, chancellor, but I don't think that our relations are in any way as fragile as they have been in the past decade. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for explaining uh, that. Um, how, how come that our relationship normalized um, in the last years? Well, uh, I think we put together some ground rules over the years. It took some hardship. It, took, it, it strained the Greek-German relations a lot. The media on both sides had, a, had played a great part in that, and not a, not a good one, I might add. And uh, then we did all what we were asked to do. It was as simple as that, and it got us to where we are today. Uh, of course, nobody talks about debt today because of the pandemic, but the discussion was, will, will return eventually, and then, well, Greece has uh, seemed to be, um, Greece is now governed by a more, um, um, how to say that, a reform uh, prone uh, government. So this helps a lot. Uh, and at the moment we're experiencing, we're experiencing a time of a big uh, growth, uh, financial growth. So if that keeps up, I don't expect, I don't anticipate any problems, but when the discussion comes to the stability pact, I do think that um, we might not see eye to eye with Germany and some other countries in the EU. Mm -hmm. Interesting, so a little bit of trouble ahead. Um, and that brings me back to um, Jasper. Um, you, you, well, as somebody, following uh, German politics very closely and looking at the different parties and the, also the different coalition possibilities. Um, could you also lead us a little bit through what different coalitions could mean uh, for foreign policy making um, of Germany? I think uh, uh, the, the so-called traffic light coalition uh, will mean more, um, well, uh, liberal finance politics and, and fiscal policy on a European level. Um, there's just one reason to remain skeptical in, in this direction because Christian Lindner might be the finance minister in, in this coalition because he will play the role of a, uh, well, the, the co corrective to, to the more leftist tendencies in this coalition. And that makes things more complicated uh, on a European level, but, but also on the domestic level. Um, on the other side, um, uh, there will be a lot of continuity with Armin Lasser uh, as chancellor. Um, and in both cases, uh, climate policy will, will play a much, much bigger part than, um, than under uh, Angela Merkel. Um, and I don't see really differences uh, in this respect between those two coalitions. When it comes to Russia, for example, that, that is maybe the most exciting part of, of the coalition negotiations because um, the Social Democrats are, um, well, not as friendly towards Russia than uh, as they were in the 70s and the 80s. Um, on the other hand, uh, Armin Lasek is a very 
pragmatical politician. Um, but when it comes to China and Russia, he, he has to uh, remain a little cautious um, because the Greens are, are much more crit critical towards the, the existing po uh, foreign policy uh, than, than the Conservatives or the Liberals. Uh, but as I said, in general, there, there won't be too much uh, changes. But um, I mean, Laschet is, is a politician, I would say, who is much more the continuity of Helmut of Kohl than, than Angela Merkel. And that means um, he will try to build bridges within the EU and um, uh, beyond the EU. Um, and he is a, his style is much more on a person-to-person uh, politics. So he will try to get some friends among um, politicians in uh, five countries. Uh, and that's a much more pragmatical uh, approach towards, towards foreign policy uh, than we have it, and then we will, will have it uh, under a traffic. Um, so, so Jasper, um, you, if I get that correctly, um, you are not discarding the possibility of a continuation of the Grand Coalition or Jamaica Coalition because you have um, repeatedly come back uh, to Laschet and uh, talking about his foreign policy stance. So you, your assumption is not he is out. He could be in. I don't know. I, I think today he made his First mistake, I would say, he, he had to try to to become the chairman of the uh, members of parliament of his of his faction in the, the parliament. He didn't do that uh, so far. I don't know. Um, maybe we you know more tomorrow. But uh, he has to. Um, well, the, the party has to to be unified behind him. Uh, so he had he has to to manage what he couldn't manage during the election campaign. And the first thing he had to do is to, to bring the faction behind, bring all the members of, of parliament of the CDU and the CSU behind him. And um, if Ralf Brinkhaus remains the chairman, uh, he can't really guarantee that. Uh, so this is his first weak point, I would, I would say. Uh, but of course, I mean, Jamaica is as possible as, as the traffic light coalition. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about that. Great, thank and, you. And, 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 and I don't wish to have the grand coalition. Back. I mean, <laughs> would be the worst case, I guess. Yeah, and um, I think there's a, there was at least uh, seems to be dis uh, agreement among the voters um, that that is something they did not want. Um, and not, uh, yeah, they want to and, and I would say, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I'm, I'm representing a conservative newspaper, but to be honest, a real change would be a traffic light coalition. And that would clarify some uh, landscape. And for us, it's more interesting than than it might be journalistic. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and now it's um, also the time for our um, our participants to join in um, and ask questions. And you do so by raising your electronic hand, which you can do under the little button of um, reactions. And then I would call on you um, and give you the floor to ask um, your question. You could also send it in, in the chat uh, box, um, but since this is uh, in, in, as intimate as it can be um, on Zoom, um, but a small enough group um, so that I could actually um, give you the floor. So don't be shy and raise your um, electronic hand. Okay, I'm not seeing any um, any questions coming in yet. Um, uh, so we do have um, several young younger participants, uh, which I'm seeing. Um, here among our list of participants. So this is also a possibility for our young, um, young foreign policy, uh, aha. And um, Emily is the first one who is going to break the ice. Emily, go yes. ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my, my question isn't like perfectly worked out now, of course, um, but uh, I thought it was very interesting that all of you talked a lot about policies, of course, 
But what stood out for me as well is the fact that personality and just this sort of personality cult is more and more becoming important in Germany as well. And um, I was wondering just your assessment, is that a result of 16 years of Merkel being so present in German politics, or is that just generally a development that we have to take into consideration? Because of course, like Christian Lindner as a potential financial minister is very interesting, but I'm wondering if we're moving closer to something like uh, Le Pen versus Macron, Biden versus Trump, down the line in Germany and sort of what your view on that is. And that is a question to everyone, I guess, because it's, it doesn't apply to just one country. Great, thank you so much. Um, back to you, Tom. Yeah, um, so I have two questions and, and two answers. On, on the second question, is, is Germany becoming more, more polarized? I think the answer to that is pretty clearly no. And thank God for that. Because um, one of the things I find so interesting about this result is while on the one hand, you've got this increasing fragmentation of the vote and the two Volkspartei and the, the Christian Democrats and the SPD combined got about half of the vote yesterday, which is much less than they've ever got before. On the other hand, that fragmentation is not leading to a, a strengthening of the extremes. Um, the AFD, I think, was pretty much flat on its 2017 result. And of course, Die Linke had a terrible night. What you're actually seeing then is sort of complicated, but it's a fragmentation of the center. So the two old people's parties are shrinking. Um, the Greens, although they feel disappointed, had a very good night in historical terms, and the FDP remain a strong party. Um, so actually, this for me is a great legacy of Angela Merkel, is the sort of the merkel mitter these, these big group of voters in the center that she was so successful in mobilizing and that the other parties have sometimes struggled a little bit to mobilize. That is where the center of gravity is in French, uh, in German <laughs> politics. If you, I was gonna make the comparison to France where, you know, I mean, who knows, you know, Cécile Orsi can talk about this in more detail, but we may be headed towards another Macron versus Le Pen vote next year. Year. And this that represents an extremely stark choice about the future of that country. Here, the center remains extremely strong, and we'll all get very excited about is it will be will it be Jamaica, will it be traffic light? But at the end of the day, Germany is going to have a strong democratic government of the center. And I think that that's something that the rest of Europe can be very happy about. Great, thank you so much. Uh, before I hand over to Jasper again, um, Tom, the, the, the movement towards the center. Um, and the, the, well, the fragmentation of the center, is that going to make governing more difficult or more easier in a coalition? And I think you'd have to say it's going to be harder um, for the straightforward reason that we're almost certainly headed towards the first three-party government at federal level since the 1950s. Um, we all know it's going to take a long time to get a coalition deal. The FDP and the Greens disagree about almost everything. Well, they disagree about a lot anyway. So that, that, in a formal sense, that fragmentation is absolutely going to make things harder. On the other hand, you know, as these parties are all parties of the centre, Although when you're kind of immersed in German politics, you're really focused on the differences between them and what do they say about the Schuldenbremse or the Stability and Growth Pact. I think if you do an international comparison, then you will see that the differences between these parties who are going to find themselves in government is not vast, it's not insurmountable. And that because these parties are all ultimately parties of the center that agree on Germany's fundamental disposition and its position in NATO and the EU and, and the social market economy, that at the end of the day, it shouldn't be too difficult for them to find the common ground they need to put a stable government together. Great, thanks so much. Over to Jasper. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think Tom is, is totally right when it comes to, to uh, polarization and, and personality in German uh, politics and, and the stability of our Volkspartei, or people's uh, parties. But um, I mean, I, I just see one, uh, one um, danger. If you, if you look at the populace in Saxony, they, they, they are by far the strongest party there. Uh, they're reaching 30% or 25, 26%. Uh, they're stronger than, than each of the other people uh, parties. And if they can find some kind of a German Le Pen, uh, then they, uh, they, they're really a, a challenge for, for the other parties. And then, and then you can observe, if you look at Markus Söder in uh, the Bavarian uh, uh, leader of the, the sister party of the Conservatives, 
Um, I think he, he, he tried something like a new type of a politician trying to to uh, uh, to, to get a, a very broad center vote um, um, area for, for himself, and, and that was that was the, his biggest point towards uh, Armin Laschet. And uh, I think we, we will have a discussion how the old Volkspartei um, can be stronger with uh, personalities like Markus Söder or uh, like we had it in the past, uh, like, like uh, Helmut Kohl, Gerhard Schröder, or uh, you name it. So uh, we will have this discussion in the, in the next years. And um, it, um, it doesn't matter which coalition we, we have then, but, but uh, it will be an ongoing discussion. Cecilia. Yeah, I, I, I would like to talk about France uh, to make maybe some 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 clarification uh, uh, when it comes to compare French and Germany. I think in France, what you, we, you have a very very different system, political system. Everything is uh, the, the 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 most important election is an election for the president for the presidency, and you have uh, this. Uh, uh, you had uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, uh, change of constitution, which means that the parliament and the presidency are at the same time. So you have a, a huge concentration on the personality of the president, which means that the uh, it, 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 which means that the polarization in the debate is, very, is, is much more important than in Germany. In Germany, you, you still have the system of representation where everybody has to talk to everybody. It's not, it's co it doesn't come to one person who the winner takes it all. That's the French system. That's a, make a, a huge difference. And the, the success of, of um, Marine Le Pen, um, you, you have two two main reasons. First first reason that uh, uh, um, the, the Macron uh, ex made the, the political system explode. The parties, the 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 all two old parties don't, don't don't exist anymore. And you have this second person, this this opposition with Marine Le Pen, and she. She she shifted to the center, uh, so uh, it's so that she could uh, gain more support from the from the the rest uh, the 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 um, from the um, part of the um, of the of the political landscape uh, on the right side. So that's a huge difference with Germany, and I think Germany still has this very uh, this system where everybody has to talk to everybody, and uh, you can you cannot and no no none of the party can have. Uh, uh, most of the of the votes, uh, and uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's a big difference. And I would add uh, last point: uh, we lost in France, I think, due to this uh, this very uh, the big importance of of presidents, the capacity to talk to everyone. That's uh, uh, that's the reason why we had this uh, huge episode of uh, yellow vest. There are people who don't feel represented in any party, so they lost the trust in the capacity of political system to represent themselves. That to represent them, and you don't find that in Germany. Maybe, maybe you you will find that in Eastern former Eastern Germany. This lack of trust in the political system. Um, to represent them, that uh, I would I would make uh, those uh, uh, observation to make the very, to, to underline the difference between uh, France and Germany. Thank you so much, Melissa. For a second, I thought that you were frozen because you so diligently held your hand. Like I can't find my Zoom <laughs> hand today. I just wanted to make a thank you for for noticing my hand, Stormy. I wanted to say, well, first of all, just building on what CC said about the polarization and the inability to talk to each other. We, you know, we we own that. We started that in the United States, and it's a terrible way to do politics. But I have two thoughts. One is, is when I first came to Germany in the 1990s. Uh, 
everybody was up in arms about the Americanization of German politics and of German election campaigns. And at the time, I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> I would say, though, for the first time this time, we did see an Americanization of it, and nobody seemed to mind. And it was with this very tight focus on the personalities. Um, and I personally think that is a legacy of Merkel because she was such a big personality. She took all of the oxygen out of the room. She could run a campaign on, you know me. And then suddenly when she was gone, everybody kind of panicked. And, and you saw that there was a certain forgetting of how do we do campaigning again? You know, even in these Triela, there was no foreign policy. Where was foreign policy in the Triela? It was nowhere to be seen. But I think at the same time, we are living in an, in an Instagram generation. And Instagram is all about, about the personality. And, and I think we saw even with some of the issues that were coming up, Lash at Laughing, um, the book, uh, the plagiarizing the book, there's a tendency to look more uh, with more scrutiny at the individual. And I, I think it's going to be hard to move away from that, even though, as somebody was pointing out in the chat, yes, a lot of the voters are still older voters, but we're starting to see that the politicians themselves, um, at least in, in Germany, not necessarily everywhere in the United States, um, we have younger people coming up. And they communicate differently and, and they are more focused on individuals. And I think going forward, that certainly will have an impact on, on uh, how campaigning will be done. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa, for pointing that out. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you saw that, but the Tagesspiegel has a really cool, cool project where it analyzes um, the social media activities of the, of the parties and the individual candidates, um, checking where they are active, um, how much their followers and how that looks like and so on. It's really interesting. And what I found particularly interesting was taking a look at the hashtags and the concepts the different parties used. And what I found extremely, um, well, maybe not that surprising, but I think this is something which, which the parties still have to learn. Um, for example, the CDU um, hardly ever used the hashtag climate. And that was so surprising because they were on Instagram, which caters a lot to the younger people. And then you use the hashtag Heimat, and then you are surprised that that doesn't work. Um, <laughs> so I think there's a little bit um, of learning also to do with the, um, with the uh, um, new media, so to say. But let's uh, hand over to Faye. So I, I just wanted to make a comment on personalities because in, in my country, for instance, it's all about the temperament of a leader. Um, in, in what I found fascin fascinating in Germany and Angela Merkel all these years is like, well, she lacked uh, temperament and maybe we would have wished for some more temperament and less um, logic sometimes on her part, but um, she managed to refrain from populism, from image making, from spinning the facts in a time of social media where image is everything. And uh, this is highly appreciated. And uh, maybe it's one of the reasons why what you said before, um, Angela Merkel's uh, popularity has grown even in Greece. For us, is something like, like a, a breath of fresh air. And I really hope that um, her uh, successor walks, uh, keeps walking in the same path. I mean, I wouldn't like to see one more uh, populist uh, leader in Europe. In, in such a strong country as Germany, even more. So unfortunately, um, time is getting really short. So we have to already get into our last um, round. Um, over the weekend, I listened to a, a podcast with Constanze Stelzenmüller. Um, you know, all know her most likely. And she said Germany is a lot of times the 500 pound gorilla in the room um, who thinks um, he is a mouse um, way, uh, and has not yet accepted its, its weight. And she also said it's when the gorilla turns, everybody else's windows are shaking, but the gorilla doesn't notice it. Um, so my last question um, to, to all of you is um, looking, looking over at the chancellery um, and the next four years, what would be your foreign policy advice to the next chancellor? What should he, it's probably going to be a he, um, <laughs> take into account um, and maybe do differently or continue doing as um, in, in the past? And I would like to start um, with you, Cecile. 
Well, I would say um, keep going, taking responsibility for the world and, um, and uh, thinking European. European in the key, uh, all of European countries and especially with Paris, but thinking big, uh, I think uh, Germany started to do it, but uh, go ahead. Thank you so much, Cecile. Um, over to you, Tom. Um, I think the advice has to be that it's no longer possible, it probably hasn't been possible for quite a while now, for Germany to pretend that its preeminent role as a geoeconomic power can be completely divorced from geopolitics. And you see that nowhere more obviously than in the growing competition between America and China, which of course is far from just being a military competition, it touches upon everything. It touches upon trade, upon technology, upon third party dis diplomacy. Um, there's been a very, very slow acknowledgement in some German circles that this has strong implications for Germany's place in the world, but it hasn't really yet penetrated to the top. And I think that's probably the number one priority for the next German chancellor is to understand that economics and politics no longer function in separate domains. And I have to leave now, I'm afraid. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Tom. And over to you, Melissa. I would echo what both Cecile and Tom just said and put it much more broadly saying uh, the chancellery should understand that whether they want to or not, they are a power and, and that power doesn't have to be feared. It can be respected and used wisely. And Germany is in a position to do that. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, and over to you, Faye. Well, I would like to see the next chancellor exercising a little bit more attention on issues like human rights and civil society when it comes to foreign relations. And we haven't seen so much in the uh, past. And I'm not only talking about like uh, China, the obvious um, country, I'm talking also about Turkey, for instance, and some countries in Europe, we, even within Europe. So I would like to see more of that. And last but not least, least Jasper. Uh, I would uh, give in three points as an advice. First of all, you have to end the polarization within the U European Union between East and West. That's, that's the main part in the European policy, I guess. Second part would be the climate policy, and then, then you have to build up international diplomacy and uh, be active on an international scale. And the third point is stop talking about uh, responsibility internationally, just on a theoretical uh, level, do something. I mean, change, change foreign policy in the direction of um, um, more responsibility. Thank you so much. These were great last words, I have to say. Um, so not just talk the talk of responsibility, but also walk the talk um, of responsibility. And I, will, Melissa, I very much also like what you said with regard to that power doesn't have to be feared if power and leadership are applied in a responsible and thoughtful um, way. And uh, thank you also, Faye, for bringing in some policy areas, um, which I'm sure are going to be really important over the last uh, over the next years, um, human rights issues um, and climate issues. So let me end by underlying these have not been just um, exciting elections. I think these are going to be exciting coalition negotiating times, and these are going to be four years of exciting, hopefully exciting um, German uh, foreign policy making and this was an exciting panel. These were exciting panelists and exciting insights. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. We will continue this dialogue. We will continue our Aspen international um, meetings, luncheons and breakfasts. And hopefully next time we will see all of, all of you, all of each other again in person. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and then I wish all of us and all of you a happy election results analyzing time. <laughs> Thanks for being Thank here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye.